Hello, my name is Chris and I'm both a river scientist and a lecturer in physical geography at UWE Bristol. Welcome to the second in a series of five mini lectures about drainage basin hydrology that are designed to help anyone studying A-level geography. Before you go any further, please make sure that you have watched the lecture that comes before this one and that you have a copy of the worksheets that go along with the lectures so that you can fill them in as you go and finish with a complete set of notes for you to revise from. You can find a link to these worksheets below, as well as links to the other four lectures in this series. OK, let's get started with Lecture 2, Introduction to the Drainage Basin System. The main components of a drainage basin are illustrated in this diagram. Pause the video now to give yourself time to fill in the gaps in the version of this diagram that is in your worksheet. A drainage basin, also known as a catchment, is an area of land, like this one, that drains through a particular point known as an outlet. The borderline around the edge of the drainage basin that separates it from other drainage basins is known as a watershed. Precipitation lands on a drainage basin's hill slopes and then travels down those hill slopes in order to enter river channels. Water flows downstream along those river channels, joining up with the other channels that make up the river channel network before reaching the outlet. Where a river channel is able to, it meanders from side to side to create a flat area around itself called a floodplain. Drainage basin hydrology is best understood by thinking about the drainage system as an open system, which has inputs, a series of processes that those inputs then go through, and then outputs that are dependent on a combination of the nature of the inputs and processes. Pause the video now to enter the inputs, processes and outputs of the drainage basin system within the version of this diagram that is within your worksheet. This diagram shows where all of those inputs, processes and outputs occur on a drainage basin's hill slope. Pause the video again now to enter the inputs, processes and outputs into the correct places within the version of this diagram that is within your worksheet. We will now go through each of those inputs, processes and outputs in detail. Precipitation is the falling of water from the sky either as rain, snow or hail. Precipitation intensity, which is the rate at which uh, precipitation falls, has a strong influence over a drainage basin's hydrology and varies over time and space based on the climate of an area. Interception is when a layer of vegetation prevents precipitation falling directly onto the hill slope surface. After being intercepted, the water has to travel via either through flow or stem flow to reach the hill slope surface. Through fall is where water drips to the ground from the vegetation leaves and branches. And stem flow is where the water flows down the branches and trunk of vegetation to reach the ground. As well as slowing down the rate at which precipitation reaches the hill slope surface, Interception also allows time for some water to be lost back into the atmosphere via evaporation. Evaporation is when liquid water is converted into water vapour, gas. As well as water that has been intercepted by vegetation, evaporation can also take place on other hill slope surfaces, such as from soil and tarmac. Once water has reached the hill slope surface, it is usually infiltrated vertically downwards through pores in the soil. Infiltration capacity is the maximum rate at which a surface can absorb precipitation. If water is unable to infiltrate into the hill slope surface, then it will travel down the hill slope as overland flow, which is also known as surface runoff. 
overland flow is a very quick route for water to move downhill slopes into river channels. In addition to the process of interception, vegetation on the hill slope will also take in some of the water that is infiltrated into the soil through the process of absorption and then release any excess water as water vapour through the process of transpiration. The two processes that we have seen are responsible for outputting water from the drainage basin system as water vapour, evaporation and transpiration, are often combined into the term evapotranspiration. However, it is important to remember that they are two completely separate processes. Once water has been infiltrated into the soil, it can move laterally through the soil down the hill slope in a process known as through flow. Through flow is often a quick route for water to move down hill slopes into river channels. Water within the soil can also keep infiltrating downwards until it reaches the bedrock underneath. If it reaches permeable bedrock, such as chalk, then it will continue to move slowly downwards through the rock through the process of percolation. Once the water reaches an impermeable layer, such as granite, it will not be able to travel any further downwards. Water that is trapped within permeable rock above an impermeable layer is known as groundwater and will saturate, which means fill up the spaces within, the permeable layers above. The upper level of this saturated zone is known as the water table. Groundwater within the saturated zone can move laterally down the hill slope as groundwater flow. Groundwater flow is a very slow route for water to move downhill slopes into river channels. Once water has moved downhill slopes as either overland flow, through flow or groundwater flow, it makes its way into a river channel and begins to move downstream as channel flow. The channel flow from all of the branches within the catchment network join together to contribute to the flow that reaches the drainage basin outlet. Okay, thank you for listening. I hope that you found that interesting. Please check out the remaining three lectures in this series using the links below.